Thank you, Brad, and thank you everybody for coming here. You know, I've been coming to this meeting since uh, January 2009. I think Jaya had that meeting, and then it was the time of the inaug presidential inauguration, and he paused the meeting to stream President Obama's address. So I remember that first meeting. And thank you so much to Greg, to Brad, and especially to Lynn McCready and the people at the CSGMS Integration Facility for inviting me here. So my talk is on a little bit changing gears here, I'm not going to show you any equations, I'm not going to show you any sediment, I'm not going to show you anything which deals directly with Earthscape evolution, but I will show you something which is a precursor of all of this, and it's the global hydrological cycle extremes, floods, droughts, landslides, and permafrost. So when you think about it, hydrological extremes such as floods, droughts, landslides, and permafrost are very important scientifically, we all like the science, but they're very important societally. You see this in the newspaper almost all the time. These are environmental extremes which can reshape the landscape right before our eyes. We're not talking about millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years. The question I deal with all the time is how can we harness satellite observations and publicly available models in order to quantify this? And what is the spatial variability and the temporal repeat of such extremes? What's the role of land use and land cover change? And for the last question, I'm trying to pose you an answer as well. What's the future? And the future is fusion of data. So, start with a joke. What did I tell the sediment? I think I gave it out yesterday. Go with the flow. So, seriously, when do you have more overland flow? You have more overland flow when we have a wet surface and low infiltration. This is basic hydrology. So then coupling this with what I'm talking today, you know, floods occur when you have wet soils, when you have low infiltration, large overland flows, and high sediment mobilization. You have droughts, you have dry soils, you hardly have any rain or infiltration, no flow, and no sediment, no sediment supply. Landslides is a sudden displacement of the soil, and it can even cause secondary effects like blockage of flow. Landslides can cause lots of secondary effects. And then permafrost thaw is sub suddenly becoming a very important fact in high mountain Asia, parts of Alaska and parts of Siberia, where you have, you know, suddenly you have, you know, soil which can be eroded. We are in a golden era. We've had so many sensors, so many things, and we are measuring many hydrological variables and many hydrological variables by many sensors over long periods of time. Obviously, the longest one is vegetation and surface temperature, but we also have rainfall, soil moisture, uh, uh, total water, water level, and uh, the atmospheric variables. And all of this fits very nicely into a global hydrological cycle. And this cartoon is also in the National Academy's Decadal Survey. And so you can see these different sensors uh, measuring different parts of the hydrological cycle. And it's all very self-explanatory there. So if you look at this and create a nice movie, you see that hydrological cycle makes sense. These are four quantities derived from four completely different sources. The normalized difference vegetation index from the Modis Terra, the liquid water thickness from the Grace uh, precipitation from final Imers run, and then surface soil moisture from SMOS. It's a 10 year period, that's why we didn't use MAP. And you can see as it rains, especially in the middle of Africa, the ITCC goes up and down, the vegetation goes up and down, the liquid water content uh, increases with more blue and decreases with more red, the soil moisture varies appropriately. And obviously a movie will not solve you all the problems, but it's a good way to start your story. So I'm gonna focus a bit on soil moisture before I start using it. So we have downscale soil moisture to one kilometer using MODIS. This is a SMAP soil moisture downscale to one kilometer, and most of these are published, so the publications are listed below. But if you have any questions, just reach out to me and I'll be happy to uh, answer. So you can see over here that the, uh, the one kilometer and the nine kilometer, they show differences. At the higher spatial resolution of one kilometer is probably not as apparent on a global scale, but you can see that sometimes the one kilometer has lack of data because of clouds, because they're using surface temperature and vegetation index. Now, on the other hand, if you come to the United States, it's a little easier to see it because you can see the fact that, you know, 
there is more holes in areas at one kilometer. Uh, the nine kilometer does look a little bit more painted over, whereas it, this looks like more blown on. But if you come to an even smaller catchment, and this is the Sacramento San Jose River Basin, as well as the Danube River Basin, you, can't, you can start seeing that the one kilometer starts showing you those pixelations, which you don't see in the nine kilometers. Uh, now, you don't have to take my word for this. The global one kilometer soil moisture is validated for over 1,500 locations, and no other product has that. So, and it's, this is a public product available to everybody, soon to be hosted on uh, NSIDC website. So you can see this, the nine kilometer does well, but the one kilometer does better. And we have shown this in our publication. Now we have not stopped at one kilometer. There is a, a visible infrared imaging radiometer suite called VIRS on the EcoStress mission. And we have used this 400 meter uh, 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 sensor to downscale to soil moisture to 400 meters. Now at 400 meters, you're talking real business here because you're talking about stuff where you can start mapping quarter sections of fields. You can actually be there, you know, in a field scale. It's not yet at 10 meters, but it's good enough. And you can see over here that it's very apparent. Nine kilometer for the San Pedro watershed versus the one kilometer versus the 400 meters. And you can see over here, the reason this is arranged June 18th, June 21 and June 26 is to show this progressive dry down. And you can see so nicely that the dry down is captured better by the 400 meters, less better, but good by one kilometer, but the nine kilometer completely misses the mark. It doesn't show too much variability between June 21st to June 26th. And statistical comparison with in-situ sensor shows that the 400 meter uh, soil moisture actually performs better with comparison with sites. So, you know, uh, higher spatial scale is better. And this is an example of uh, 400, one kilometer and nine kilometer for the whole uh, for the whole United States for CONUS. And this is an example for the Washita River Basin from August 1 to 24th of 2019. And you can see over here, it's, it's been dry anyway. So it's not a huge dry down you just saw in San Pedro watershed, but you can start seeing higher and higher spatial resolutions at 400 meters, things which you don't pick up like this area you picked up, which is not over here, for example. So, you know, higher spatial resolution actually helps us to solve a lot of problems, especially when you have uh, questions about propagation of drought, it's important to go to higher spatial resolution. So I said, I'll talk about floods, droughts, uh, uh, landslides and permafrost straw. But we have a lots of, and many of these are all published over here. So this is a hurricane Florence induced flooding in South Carolina, uh, PD watershed 17 to 24 of September be using uh, uh, the gauge network as well as two instruments. One is the UAV SAR flown by JPL, 1.8 meters by 0.8 meters spatial resolution, 16 kilometer SWAT L band. And the Sentinel one, which is European uh, C band instrument with a uh, five by 20 meter spatial resolution and a 250 kilometer SWAT. And you can see that we have pretty good coverage. And again, we intersperse them because UAVSR did not fly on that aircraft every day and neither did Sentinel overpass this place every day. So, and, and both of these are active sensors. So, and a pretty good spatial resolution. And the proof of the pudding is in the comparison. And you can see over here that for these gauges, for different days, we get very, very good R squared and low RMSCs. And the best part is difference between September 18th and September 24th of 2018, you can see the, the difference between the water surface depth or elevation, it almost falls on a straight line, R squared of 0.99. I don't think machine learning could do better. And this is another flooding, Hurricane Harvey in early, early September, late August of 2017 in Houston. And you know, Houston is a very urbanized area as opposed to PD watershed, which is pretty rural. And you can see over here, they pick up very nicely these elevations of this, uh, flood depths. I'm very sorry that this font is so small, but the pink is greater than three meters, which starts from zero to one meters. But you can see this, these R squared and the scatter plots with the gauges show 
pretty good results. And again, no massaging, no model, nothing. We're just pulling the data, making sure they're all georeferenced. Now, fast forward to a bigger scale and a different sensor. MODIS over Australia, the wet time was late. December 2010 and early January 2011. Dry time was 2006. We are doing three measures here. The land surface temperature, uh, the change in the land surface temperature from morning to evening is a measure of the uh, thermal inertia. So the difference in the land surface temperature tells you if there's lots of water, the land surface temperature will not change between morning to evening because you know water temperature doesn't change much during the day, maybe one to two degrees. And then the... Uh, 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 API antecedent precipitation index, uh, more blue means more water and soil moisture from MSRE. And this was uh, also published long ago. And we actually used data from right this, this building, from Dalton Flood Observatory, and connected it to a few flood events in, in December and January 2010, 2011, and said that, hey, look, we can see the LST decreasing, the API increasing, and the soil moisture increasing, and we even demarcated the regions in the Murray-Darling Basin, which had flooding. So proof of concept. And uh, the last one was preparing a MODIS map at one kilometer for the whole of the lower Mekong for 2003 to 2015 to demarcate the flooded areas. And this was done with a lot of comparisons and with actives and passive sensors and published you know, a couple of years ago. Now droughts. There's a big ongoing drought right now, the La Plata River Basin, big one. You can see here that the groundwater percentile is becoming redder and redder. And there's also the, the uh, uh, soil moisture percentile is also becoming redder and redder, which means it's getting drier and drier. And it's, it's actually right now, going on right now. So what we have done is we have taken our SMAP one kilometer, which I showed you, and seen that just for the same month of August, from 2015 to 21, you can see how it is drying up spatially at one kilometer. And this means that, you know, all those rivers over there, they're probably not going to be flowing. Not flowing means not much sediment. This is Lower Mekong River Basin for 2015, 2016. They had a drought and a recovery. And this shows very nicely the co-variability of precipitation, soil moisture, total water storage for every month. And this one is even more charming. So you can see over here, the soil moisture keeps decreasing till about April and then starts increasing. And it's reflected through the rainfall and the total water storage anomaly. So you can see the total water storage anomaly keeps increasing. This is the Limpopo River Basin, which is now right now in a drought. You can see over here. And we have looked at the soil moisture the, uh, uh, and, and the runoff and the so soil moisture and the ETs and all of that stuff from GLDAS as well as the P minus ET minus R and the total soil moisture anomaly all the way from 2002. So the one good thing we can do is we can put this in perspective and compare not just, just look at the flood or look at the drought, but compare the two. Contrast is a very good you know, instrument. And you see over here, uh, this is the Lower Mekong River Basin, September 2011, nice wet rain. January 2005, nicely, very, very dry. And that's reflected in the MODIS ET anomaly, reflected in the GLS runoff anomaly and the grace water thickness. See, all different hydrological variables, all coming from different sources, but they tell a very consistent story which appeals to understanding the hydrological cycle. And so is the case with Murray-Darling Basin, where you see dry 2009, we just so Murray Darling anyway, and then this is wet January 2010, and you can see over here the same things occur. Lake Victoria River Basin, and again, this is not published yet, so no pictures, please. So you can see the same thing. This is a wet October 2019, a dry November 2021. You can see the precipitation anomalies, the runoff anomalies, the ET anomalies, total water storage, and the runoff again for the another period. And then here is that nine and one kilometers. And but what you can see over here that the one kilometer shows you so much higher spatial variability of the areas. So for local planners, for local uh, people who want to do work in these areas, local communities, you know, this is a powerful tool. Landslides. So there's a lot of landslides all over the world. And 
this is an inventory for 10 years in uh, lower Mekong River Basin. And surprisingly, there's a lot of changes. And each of these areas, we quantify the change, ag to forest, ag to urban, forest to ag, forest to urban, et cetera. And what these tell you actually, the source of the satellite, the source, and the number of landslides. So we have a huge inventory of landslides. So what we have done is a frequency ratio, that is the number of landslides occurring in that category divided by the area of that category. And what you see here is conversion of agriculture to forest is the biggest contributor. Okay. All of these zeros says that it eh, doesn't matter. And all of these positive are important. Agriculture, no change shows some landslide. Forest, no change shows some landslide. But these are the ones which are the most bothersome and the largest. And then we also use a, a regression model. And the regression model is an established model. And we put in the, uh, the logistic regression coefficients and their p-values. What this tells us is for each category, like land use, land cover change coefficient, for each of those categories, we see there is a place where there is a biggest contributor. For example, for a distance to road, uh, you can see that there are some places where it's very important and some places where it's not important. So these tell you the order of magnitude importance of various factors in landslides. Permafrost. This is a very simple map of the mean annual ground temperature from MODIS for a 14 year period. And it's the mean annual ground temperature varies very widely over the last, uh, over those 14 year periods. Not only that, that it also shows you a very nice shift because when you start talking about permafrost thaw, it's important to see that this MALSD, mean average, uh, uh, mean, average uh, mean area land surface temperature, it's moving more to the right, which means that the periods are getting warmer. Most people's permafrost zonation is based on climatology. This is based on actual satellite observations. And you can see, this is what we produced as a permafrost zonation index, and which compares well with the past studies, but it shows significant differences. And again, this is being reviewed right now. Now, all I talked about so far is trying to say, oh, we can do this, we can do that. But we have to not just monitor, but also use this stuff together. And synergistic usage is what is, what is one of the most important concepts for my group. You take six small watersheds in Vietnam with rain gauges and stream gauges and feed one of these watersheds, and we have all the results in the paper, uh, with a rain gauge driven simulation, you calibrate it and validate it. And then uh, iMERGE version six, which is a NASA satellite precipitation product, you calibrate it and validate it. And lo and behold, you can see the answer so easily. The rain gauge driven simulations fail to capture the peaks of the simulated stream flow, whereas the rainfall from satellite does. Now, the, the key for that, the message is that the rainfall from satellite may not be accurate. We don't claim that. But it has that spatial continuity, which is lacking in rain gauges, which are points. And simply interpolating them is not the best way to go on. And lastly, soil moisture assimilation. You know, we have a lot of models. We have a lot of satellite systems and tons of that. You know, you don't have to write another model to do something. But you also have outputs on the model. This is the soil moisture output from the NOAA MP3.6. And this is the soil moisture from the Cygnus and the SMAP sensors put together for a couple of, couple of days here. And what we have been doing is we have been using the, uh, the enhanced ensemble Kalman filter to, to merge the two. And what we see and is a very significant the finding is that there are some places where your estimates improve flux estimates, latent heat flux, other, other independent uh, quantities uh, 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 using just Cygnus data uh, or just using SMAP, et cetera. And this is where it's important because you are now feeding a model, giving the error characteristics of the model and the observations and seeing what impact can you make for hydrological simulation. So, the credit goes to all the people who did the work. I mean, I'm just the messenger. As I call myself, I'm the hydrological concierge. And uh, uh, I don't know to program in Python. So 
Somebody asked me, do you know Python? I said, yes, it's a big snake in South America. <laughs> but I'm actually reminded of this great quote. I used to walk past it for a few years when I was working at Goddard. It's difficult to say what is impossible for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and reality of tomorrow. Robert Goddard, after whom the Goddard Space Flight Center is named and the inventor of the rocket. So final thoughts. Observations and model simulations are two sides of the coin which help understand the problem. So you can't say either or, you can't. Satellite and remotely sensed observations can help convey spatial variability that is of utmost importance or constraining or and or validation of models. There is seldom no alt alternative to in-situ measurement. So field hydrology, field geology will always have a place because you know that's the most direct quantification of any variable. And hydrological extremes are environmental extremes, which have a great impact for landscape evolution. Work was funded by NASA, and thank you very much. Hi. Oh, <laughs> I didn't realize there was a bit of an echo in here. Okay. That was a really cool talk. Um, I really like the perspective of using different types of satellite to show differences in hydrologic um, regimes. And so my question is more towards, this is really cool for spatial analysis as we continue to improve resolution within our satellites that we send up. But I'm wondering in terms of temporal analysis, are we able to use these new and improved resolution data sets to sort of quantify going into the future how, for example, landslides or hydrologic extremes may occur? Yes, absolutely. The whole point of data simulation is to improve the status of the model right now. You know, and there's a lot of other things which go into it. And I'm just trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, make a simple answer. Uh, absolutely. And uh, satellites are not going to go stop going up into the sky in the future. Actually, it's only going to get better. For example, I have a drone which was built right here in Boulder, Colorado, which gives you five meters soil moisture. So you may not be able to do a global one kilometer or five meter soil moisture, but you can do what I call as remote sensing on demand. You know, you have it in your garage, you fly it out, you know, you get your soil moisture and then it's all, you know, wet and you don't have to worry. And then two days later, it starts drying down and fly it right then. You don't have to do it. And you can do that because I think uh, somebody told me that they do the same thing with their LIDAR and see erosion from their fields. Absolutely. It's, it's fabulous, but it's a local scale study. We're not talking anything about global hydrological cycle, but that's where, you know, think globally, act locally. <laughs> 